Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of the Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Elliot Abrams, Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a veteran of the State Department under Presidents Reagan, George W. Bush, and Trump. Welcome, one and all. Our first topic that Elliot is joining us to discuss is what is happening in Cuba. Thousands upon thousands of people poured into the streets a couple of weeks ago, chanting, freedom, freedom, we are not afraid. They have um, transformed the old Castroite slogan of Patria o Muerte and changed it to Patria y Vida, which is instead of fatherland or death, it's now fatherland and life. Um, and one of the uh, lines of the song that they have been singing is, may no more blood flow for desiring to think differently. So um, the regime has responded with a crackdown. And of course, it has ignited debate in this country about our policies toward Cuba. So, Elliot, I want to start with you. Um what uh, what do you make of the argument that this is the result of the U.S. embargo and that the obvious answer as a, a full page ad in The New York Times signed by some of the usual suspects like Oliver Stone and uh, Noam Chomsky and Jane Fonda uh, argued that uh, that that's the answer is to is to end the embargo and uh, Cuba will, uh, you know, th- th- that it's cruel and so forth. How, how do you respond? Uh, one way of responding, Mona, is that that is not apparently the view of the Cuban people. And in the New York Times and a lot of other places, you see quotes from Cubans uh, acknowledging that that their problems today don't relate to uh, the embargo. Um, repression has nothing to do with the embargo. Uh, so uh, what I'm struck by, frankly, is first, this change may be a big deal. This is the first major event like this since Raul Castro ostensibly gave up power. You know, Fidel is dead. Raul is uh, theoretically in retirement. You have, you have an unbelievably um, uh, bureaucratic apparatchik, uh, Diaz Canel, who's the president of Cuba and theoretically the head of the Communist Party. Uh, who's really not going to win anybody's um, uh, anybody's loyalty to the regime. The other thing that's striking to me here is um, you use the term usual suspects, and boy, is that right. Um, there are places, some in Latin America and in Europe and the U.S., where people have changed their views and are starting to say, you know, we ought to be on the side of the Cuban people. But there are not many. Latin American leftists stay with the regime in Argentina, in Mexico, same in Europe, and unfortunately, same here. You mentioned that New York Times ad. We've also seen it from uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, um, from people like uh, AOC and, and others in Congress. It's pretty shameful because they're totally abandoning the people of Cuba. Yeah, Linda, um, there's um, there's no aspirin, there's no insulin. Uh, as the mother of a son who has type 1 diabetes, I was particularly struck by that. Um, if type 1 diabetics cannot get insulin, uh, they can die very easily. Um, uh, there are lines for everything. They have our long blackouts every day. But l- let me ask you this. Um, doesn't it make sense to end the embargo just so that they don't have a talking point of being able to say, oh, well, this is all the United States' fault? Well, uh, look, um, I, I think that's a matter that can be debated, but I think Elliot is exactly right. Uh, these demonstrations have very little to do with uh, the embargo. Uh, they are the result of people's frustration with the corruption uh, both normal, regular, everyday corruption, but also the political repression uh, that occurs in Cuba. 
And, uh, you know, I think the Obama administration in trying to open up Cuba and then, of course, Trump, you know, pulled it back. And now uh, I think, you know, there are some who would like to see, you know, going back to being more open um, for Cuba. But, you know, as for some of us who are conservatives, there was always the sort of Milton Friedman-esque uh, line on what comes first, political freedom or economic freedom. And it was uh, Milton Friedman's theory that economic freedom uh, almost always inevitably leads to political freedom. Well, we've seen in China that that is certainly not the case. And so, you know, improving life, you know, I'm, I'm obviously would like to see life-saving medicines be able uh, to get to the Cuban people, but there's no indication that it really is the American embargo um, that is depriving people. There's, again, there's corruption, there's incompetence, uh, and there is the desire of the regime, which may not be led by a Castro, but still is a communist regime, uh, to use the levers of power to be able to keep the people uh, under their thumb. And one of the ways of doing that is to make everyone uh, in Cuba totally 100% dependent on the state. So uh, I don't think that ending the embargo is the answer uh, to what ails Cuba. Mm. Uh, Bill, I think probably everybody on this center left to center right podcast would uh, agree that the Cuban regime is mostly to blame for Cuba's problems, uh, if not entirely to blame. And certainly um, it's not just that they have shortages of everything, but it's a horribly repressive and cruel uh, regime. Uh, but let me ask you the political question, because you could argue that this represents a real opportunity for the Biden administration politically, because f let's face it, Florida is a really important swing state. Arguably, um, the, the votes of uh, Hispanics who came from Venezuela and Cuba and various places uh, around the world that have been uh, oppressed by communist regimes uh, were decisive um, in 2020 in moving so many Hispanics into the Republican column. Isn't this an opportunity for the Biden administration to show its bona fides on being, you know, pro-freedom and pro the Cuban people, uh, not the regime? I couldn't agree more, Mona. Uh, and uh, I would say that although the administration has made a few steps in the right rhetorical direction, it has been less than full-throated. Uh, I am somewhat disappointed uh, that the president hasn't seized this opportunity. It's not too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's not just a political calculation, it seems to me. Uh, it's something closer to a moral imperative. Uh, it is pretty clear, I think, to fair-minded observers that there is no horizon of hope for the Cuban people under the current regime. Uh, 30 years ago, you could make the argument, I guess, uh, that life was getting better for the Cuban people, not freer, but in certain basic material senses better, it's no longer possible to make that argument. And I think what we're seeing in these demonstrations is not simply an expression of opposition. It's a, it's a plea for help, uh, for some reason to hope for a better future. And, uh, we, the United States, ought to be in the business of trying to open that path to a better future in any way that we can. And I do think that begins with the president of the United States, who has spoken out so forcefully in favor of democracy as the moral center of his foreign policy. Yeah, Damon, um, President Biden did say um, that Cuba is a failed state. And he went on to say communism is a failed, a universally failed system. So that was pretty good. Um, but uh, but somebody, a, a Democrat from the state of Florida, a Democrat from Miami, said this was insufficient. She said, this is a Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall opportunity. Do you agree? 
Um, I, I tend to be a little bit more muted about it. I mean, I think personally, yes, it is a moral imperative to speak out in favor of the, the freedom of the Cuban people. And I don't really see much of a downside to it. Uh, I mean, I think there are potential political upsides, as, as we've been discussing a little bit in Florida and perhaps some other areas of the country. But there is a, a, a kind of, a, I mean, first of all, I think in general, of course, moral imperatives don't uh, change based on their proximity to the United States, but just in kind of standard American Monroe doctrine form. I mean, if we don't take an interest in the fate of democracy 90 miles off the coast of the country, then really where are we going to take a stand? Um, you know, I, I my position on Afghanistan and some of our other involvements uh, in the world is a, perhaps a little bit more skeptical than some on this podcast, but I also, as a, as a foreign policy realist, think that the uh, the that we have to adjust where we stand based on the particulars of the situation and the fact that just off the coast of the United States, there appears to be a kind of regime shaking protest movement uh, cropping up indigenously within the Cuban people seems to cry out for us to say something. Although I would also add two quick points. One is that, the, you know, Biden has said some things, but I do think the overall response has been a little muted from him. There certainly has been very little coming from Republicans or conservatives who appear to have really no appetite for promoting liberty abroad at this point. Um, and and that, I think, is an expression of our moment. Uh, there's a real hesitation. There's a fear, I suspect, among some Democrats in and around the administration that if we destabilize the government and violence breaks out, that we're going to have tens of thousands or more Cubans uh, coming to southern Florida, and there's really no appetite to deal with the complex political calculations that would flow from that and the immigration questions would open up. Biden does not want that to be uh, the thing that dominates our politics over the next six months or more. And then the other thing I would just put on the table for pondering is China. Um, Cuba only really allowed something resembling sort of a free internet a couple of years ago. Now, of course, they also have retained the power to just shut it down as they've been trying to do once the protests broke out. But the lesson for China and other would-be dictatorships around the world is pure verification of their instinct that you must never allow the internet because once you do, it can at any moment become a destabilizing force. It can be, become the great disruptor, as we all know it to be, in good and bad ways here. Mm. Uh, and so I, I really, I, I, I am a somewhat concerned that uh, China and other countries are going to look at this and say, see, that is why we must never allow the people to have this unbelievably powerful uh, medium of dissent and organization uh, to be permitted in our country. We will have digital technology, but we will control it con entirely from the top down. So those are yeah. two thoughts I have related yeah. to the situation. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. If I could jump in, Mona. I, I, uh, I have a different concern about China, which is that if this regime stays in power, we may well see it turn to China, which has been quite active in Latin America in the last decade, uh, to look for more support mm -hmm. uh, from China, which I would certainly not like to see. And I would not like to see any kind of military or security relationship develop between communist Cuba and communist China. When it uh, comes to what Republicans are saying, uh, you know, Damon, there's two conservative Republican senators from Florida, and they've been as vocal as can be. You can obviously say, well, it's just politics. I think in the case of Rubio, it's more than politics because that's his family background. Just one word on the so-called embargo. You know, we all use the word. I use the word. Um, it isn't actually an embargo. It's just saying Americans can't trade with Cuba. Cuba can trade freely with about 195 countries, um, and which I think means that any shortages or problems they have economically are the result of internal economic problems. If they can't find insulin, there's scores of countries that could supply insulin. 
the United States embargo also always accepts medical goods. One of the biggest, and food, one of the biggest suppliers of food to Cuba now, today, is the United States, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of food. So I think it, it, it's a mistake to think that our uh, prohibition on uh, commercial trade with Cuba, accepting food and medicine, really is in any way responsible for the protests. They're protests for prosperity, but they're really protests for freedom. Yeah. Um, Elliot, we've seen, though, uh, that that even mass protests in repressive countries um, can be put down. Uh, we've seen them in Iran. We've seen them in Egypt. We've seen them you know, throughout the whole Arab Spring. Um, you know, the fact that the people are desperate and dissatisfied doesn't always lead to the collapse of regimes and um, or to anything better. And so I'm just um, wondering what, where you think things are right now. Two weeks post uh, these protests, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of people who have been disappeared. Uh, their families don't know where they are. They're being detained. Um it's, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a pall of fear that seems to have descended uh, where once they were saying we are unafraid. I'm, I'm not sure that's the case now. What, what's your sense? Well, I think that's right, that, that um, <clears throat> repressive regimes uh, have terrific staying power. In Cuba, there is one special ingredient which is disappearing, and that is the Castros, which will turn it into a much grayer, less uh, interesting regime in which, uh, which is going to have a much harder time keeping uh, loyalties. Um, so I think there's reason to believe that uh, change may be coming to Cuba. But there's a second ingredient, which is what's coming from outside. Uh, is anybody helping the Cuban people? I mean, what's our broadcasting like? Through uh, state and AID and the National Democratic Institute and the Republican Institute and the National Endowment for Democracy, what are we doing? Um, are we trying to give more help? What are we doing about internet access? Have we been trying in any effective way to give people more reliable and free internet access? Um, so one of the variables here is, of course, what the Cuban government does, how many people they're willing to kill or jail. Another variable, though, is uh, us and other democracies and whether we are willing to do anything um, substantial uh, tangible to help the Cuban people. Okay. Linda, you wanted to add one more thing? Yeah, I did want to add one more thing. And I think one of the things that um, may be putting off uh, the Biden administration being more aggressive on this is the fear of a Mario Boatlift type um, event. And clearly the Cuban uh, administration has in fact uh, hinted that uh, the United States might not want to see the influx of tens of thousands of uh, Cubans uh, onto our shores. And of course, you know, we saw that happen in 1980. Uh, it, you know, played a very important role uh, in our politics. And we are now seeing, as you know, I follow immigration uh, very closely, and we are now seeing Cubans crossing in or trying to cross in uh, not successfully, usually, uh, at our southern border. So I think that, you know, the whole politics of immigration plays a role here, and that may be one of the things that the Biden administration fears. And I don't know whether Elliot feels the same or not, but I certainly think that's at least one possible explanation for why they're not being a little more aggressive. Elliot, I'd love to hear you on that, but I cannot help interjecting really quick that um, the act, the Mariel Boatlift um, is actually a laboratory experiment that economists cite for the proposition that a huge influx of immigrants does not, in fact, cause unemployment to rise or wages to decline for the uh, existing population because they studied what happened in Florida after the Mariel Boatlift and none of those things happened. But anyway, Elliot, the <laughs> last word from you, um, you if you want to respond to Linda or anything else, that, any closing thoughts? Thanks. Uh, I think Linda is right that the administration is afraid. I wish it were not true because it, it means that that small, weak, repressive regime um, really has something over the United States. And uh, so I hope that if that's true, the administration will, will think twice. I think there are things we can do. I think there are ways for Democrats and Republicans to come together 
on uh, pr programs in support of democracy in Cuba. And it is true that democracy may not come in 2021. But if you think of the Castro regime, which is slowly disappearing into history, and Raul Castro uh, in his late 80s will be going very soon as well, um, there is an opportunity here for freedom in the Americas. Well, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for joining us, Elliot. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. All right. We will now move on to the January 6th committee that uh, met this week. Some extremely um, emotional uh, testimony uh, from the police officers who held off the mob and um, and uh, right before this this uh, incredibly emotional uh, testimony, um, Elise Stefanik uh, held a press conference and blamed Nancy Pelosi uh, for the events of January sixth. So, Linda, uh, first to you. Uh, do, do you um, did you catch any of the uh, of the hearing? And um, and what do you think about Pelosi's decision to um, keep um, those uh, to keep Jim Jordan and uh, Banks off the committee? Well, first of all, yes, I did. I listened with rapt attention. I even recorded it because I had a doctor's appointment, so I couldn't watch the whole thing live. And so I went back and watched some of it. Uh, I do believe it was riveting. I also had another experience, though, and this was very similar to my experience on 9-11, which is, you know, every time after 9-11 and when we had the anniversaries, et cetera, they would show the pictures of the buildings collapsing and the planes hitting the towers. And I would feel re-traumatized every time. Well, I feel the same thing on January 6th. For those of us who live in Washington, who've spent our life in politics, and I think especially for some of us who are conservatives and therefore, you know, feel this uh, total jarring disconnect between uh, the kind of people that we used to hang around with and support and their reaction to this, there is a, a real serious trauma involved in that day. And so, I, you know, as I watch these uh, four men uh, tell their stories and watch the clips uh, again. I felt this horrible punch to the gut. Uh, I just felt like, you know, this cannot stand. I think Nancy Pelosi was absolutely right to, uh, to reject uh, Jordan and Banks. Um, I do um, think that, um, that having both Adam Kinzinger and uh, Liz Cheney on board uh, does help uh, preserve the notion that this is not simply a partisan effort. And this whole, you know, tirade of the Republicans that somehow Nancy Pelosi is to blame. First of all, it's based on a lie. Nancy Pelosi uh, does not have control over the Capitol Police. And in fact, the direct supervisors in both the House and the Senate um, on that day were appointed by Republican uh, leaders. And so, you know, if, if, if there's partisan blame to go around, it, go, it goes to the people who pick them uh, if they failed in their job. I do think that there was not enough done and that, and that the Capitol was not prepared. I've talked about this elsewhere. I have extended family members who serve in the Capitol Hill police force. And I, I think, you know, they have said um, they didn't expect anything like what happened uh, to take place. And so I think there is room to take a look at why the Capitol was so underprepared. And, and when you think about this domestic attack, I mean, obviously it could have been a foreign attack. I mean, if, if, if the Capitol is that vulnerable, that's a problem. But the main problem is that you had the president of the United States basically riling up a mob, telling them that the election was stolen, that he was the rightful president. And look, if you really believe that in your heart of hearts, if you believed, oh, my goodness, you know, there was this dramatic uh, changing of votes and the election is being stolen. I mean, I could see that you would, you know, feel tempted to go up there and march. And obviously, mobs have a psychology of their own. And once the mob begins to act, and I do think that there were those who, who were not just acting spontaneously. I think there were groups like the 
Proud Boys, like the Three Percenters and others, uh, who went to the Capitol to do violent uh, physical damage to the building and to threaten uh, the legislators. But it, it, you know, this this needs to be uh, looked at. It's it's not just because anything's going to. You're not going to change that quarter of the American population that holds firm to the belief the election was stolen. But this is for history. This is for getting at the truth. And I think it's really important. And I thought Liz Cheney is my hero now. I thought the speech she gave was so eloquent, uh, so on target. And let's not forget, lest anybody believe, Liz Cheney is no rhino. She Mm -hmm. is, is as conservative as you get on public policy. She doesn't agree with Nancy Pelosi on practically anything with respect to the kind of divisive uh, public policy debates we normally have. Uh, But she was there to defend democracy. Yeah, but Linda, no one cares about whether you're truly a conservative or not in the Republican Party anymore. That's that's so 2010. What they care about now is whether you're faithful to the orange god king, and if you are not, then 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 you're a rhino. Um, so, um, Bill Galston, I completely agree with everything Linda said, and in particular the part about what a gut punch it is to relive those hours through the testimony of those police officers. You know, we've had six months of almost normalcy, (laughs) to quote Harding, Um, and and it's felt pretty good, and it's been nice to not have to think about how much we felt like our democracy was teetering on that day. Um, uh, But... um, but to to return to it, uh, it it hasn't lost any of its power to shock in my uh, in my judgment. What was your reaction? Well, my reaction, to be honest, was a little bit more emotionally distant than that. Uh, you know, I I experienced what happened on January sixth more as a tragedy than as a trauma. Maybe I'm insufficiently open emotionally to the possibility of trauma. Uh, And so I didn't feel re-traumatized by the proceedings. I was enormously saddened by them, however, because it, it induced a different set of reflections, namely that all of this could have been avoided if Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell had simply agreed to a nonpartisan 9-11 style commission, which was the opening bid, and the, it was the right way to do this. I mean, once they rejected that and left it up to the Speaker of the House to proceed, it was inevitable, I'm afraid, uh, that the inquiry would be put through a partisan grid, even if there was a maximum effort on the part of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, to keep it as nonpartisan or bipartisan as possible. And so I I will listen with attention to what the different witnesses have to say, I am glad that the historical record is being clarified and expanded, but we have blown an opportunity. And by we, I don't mean both parties. I mean one party in particular has blown an opportunity to use this extraordinary event as a way of distinguishing between conservatism and extremism. And here we are. Uh, I have no confidence and no expectation uh, that the people who need to hear this testimony are going to pay any attention to it whatsoever. Yeah, Damon, uh, Bill's point leads me to my next one, which is that next to um, what happened on January 6th, possibly almost as distressing, is the right-wing reaction. Um, You had a series of... um, of uh, hosts on Fox News mocking the police officers suffering, um, saying that they were going for uh, for Emmys or uh, a performance uh, that they were uh, performing, um, and uh, and and you know the capacity 
on the right to believe simultaneously all kinds of self-contradictory things about that day. It, you know, from, it was actually Antifa to, well, it was just tourists who were a loving crowd or three, it was the FBI and the deep state or four, it was heroic patriots and Ashley Babbitt was a martyr. The fact that all of those things are out there circulating in right wing circles, um, suggests that they have absolutely no attachment to logic or reason or internal consistency. It's like anything at all will do. It's all about just owning the libs or, or you know, just expressing your, your hostility to the other side. Well, Mona, you have succeeded in answering your own question with what I was exactly going to say. I was going to bring up all of that stuff, especially. Oh, sorry. The, no, that's okay. It's 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 a great lead in. I can now go a step beyond that. Um, yes, we are. We are what well, we are seeing. And, and, and in this, I say with in the most delicate, big to differ uh, style. Uh, I love you, Linda. But. Uh, the fact is that conservatism, the word, does not mean what you say it means and what it meant for you through most of your adult life and career. It means something else. The very fact that Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are, are involved in this, uh, in this investigation and in this committee is proof positive to most self-described conservatives in the Republican Party these days that they are now liberals. And that is what is determining whether you are a conservative or not, is whether you're willing to throw every bit of nonsense at the wall that that Mona very nicely summarized. It's it was Antifa. It was Nancy Pelosi. It was the FBI with an inside job to make Trump look bad. It was who the heck knows. And you know what? This is straight what's called polluting the information space. It's It was perfected by authoritarian and totalitarian dictatorships. It's a way to just spew out so much BS into the world that the people you care about and meaning the voters who matter to you, just throw up their arms and are like, ah, we'll never know what really happened that day. And when that happens, you get to ride to power on a tidal wave of, of cynicism. And that is what the Republican Party and its most, sorry, conservative voters are now uh, very eager to do. Now, I know there can be disputes. No, conservatism is an ideology and it has a content and these people aren't, aren't defending it anymore. Therefore, they're not conservatives. But these terms change over time. And the dynamic of, that we find ourselves in right now, as I think we all at some level recognize, is that where you are politically is determined by how you situate yourself in relation to the 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 ongoing uh, positioning of everybody else in the kind of constellation of our politics. And for most Republicans, what counts now is, are you standing with me, with Donald Trump and and our party? winning back power in in uh, 2022 and 2024 and beyond? Or are you with them, the people who want to win instead? And and where whether you're on one side or the other of that is all that matters. What happened on January 6th doesn't matter. None of it matters other than power. And it is very distressing that it has come to this. But Frankly, I, I look at the events in Washington and it, 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 it reads to me like a kind of drama put on for, for Democrats about how awful Republicans are and how often awful Trump is. And you know what? I'm in that group. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I watch and I just shake my head and I'm disgusted. But the, as, as you were saying, or I forget who, who exactly said if it was you or Bill or Linda, but 
we recognize that the very people who most need to see this and hear it are those who will never listen to it. Just as, as we will discuss, I believe in our next segment, the people who need to be wearing masks are the people who will refuse the vaccine and will never wear a mask. So who is being told to wear masks? The people who already got vaccinated who don't need the masks. So we're in this weird upside down reversal politics that uh, drives all of us nuts. But it's it's the way it works in a situation of such intense uh, partisanship and polarization. Right. Uh, Bill Galston, you wanted back in. Yeah, just I, I do think that a little bit of conceptual hygiene is in order here in the same way that it's important for analysts of the Democratic Party to be able to distinguish between liberalism and progressivism. It's important for analysts of the Republican Party to be able to distinguish between conservatism and populism. And I think it would be more accurate to say, uh, not that conservatism has changed its meaning, but that the Republican Party, or at least the major element of it, has ceased to be conservative in any recognizable, cognizable sense of that term. It has become a populist party which has very little to do with conservatism in any of the meanings that have been attached to it throughout American history or English history for that matter. Okay. Thank I'll grant, you for I'll grant that. that. We can, yes. we can, we can meet in common ground on that. Yes, absolutely. And it has become a radical party. And uh, that is the opposite of conservatism. Burkean conservatism stresses consensus and evolution over time and small steps. And uh, and that's the opposite of the mood of, uh, of the Republican Party uh, right now. I, I would just want to add that uh, the to to uh, to all of this, that that um, this tendency on the right, I think, was captured perfectly by uh, a line from Brett Stevens earlier this week, where he called it the pornification of American politics, where, you know, it has it, it now amounts to a kind of self-pleasuring impulse, uh, far less than uh, than anything about reason or compromise or anything else. And, and how how appropriate that it is Donald Trump who was led to yes. that pornification. <laughs> Yes. All right. Um, now let's turn to um, the vaccine wars, um, because uh, this this has um, this has moved to center stage. The Delta variant uh, is so much more contagious uh, than any of the than the original virus, and that any of the other variants um, that we are now facing a whole different world than even we were. A few weeks ago, uh, it's it's spreading like crazy. Mostly, it is a is an epidemic of the unvaccinated. Um, Bill Galston, you wrote about this this week and about what you think can be done. I did indeed write about the vaccination wars this week, and I've been driven to a conclusion that is not where I was even a month or two ago, namely that we have to start. Seriously, we have to start thinking seriously about moving beyond simply voluntary steps. As I was drafting uh, my piece for this week on Monday, uh, the state of California, the city of New York, and the Veterans Administration had all reached their own versions of the same conclusion. I think we're going to have a large and continuing fight about the extent to which governments, uh, businesses, nonprofits, schools, colleges and universities, and other and others can introduce and enforce vaccination as a condition of employment or a condition of being able to enter into whatever the activity is. And uh uh, President Biden himself signaled just a day ago that what the Veteran Administration, the Veterans Administration has started is very likely to be extended perhaps to the totality of the federal government. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to stop there. Uh, in my own institution, the Brookings Institution, 
uh, the president sent around a message yesterday saying that there's been a change of policy. And when we do reopen around Labor Day, if we do, uh, that proof of vaccination will be mandatory if you want to enter the building and go about your business. So this is the wave of the future. It's going to produce an enormous amount of heat and political resistance. The reaction to my column, which hit print yesterday, was instantaneous and poisonous. Mm. Uh, And I am getting emails, the likes of which I've never seen before in my life. Wow. It's going to be bitter but if we want to be able to get our country back to normal, we are going to have to take a stand on the principle that there are some things that are morally obligatory for in- individuals to do uh, for the sake of their fellow citizens and that the government of the United States and the government of the states have the right to enforce these duties if there is no or inadequate voluntary compliance. Um, Damon, one one approach that I've seen brooded about is that, look, if you have attached your identity to being vaccine skeptical, if you've said, oh, I think they're making too much of this and uh, I don't, I don't feel like I need it. I'm young and strong. You hear that a lot in focus groups. Oh, I'm young and healthy. I don't need it. Um, and isn't it helpful to a person like that to say, actually, if you want to return to the office, you have to get vaccinated? Because, oh, and by the way, some of the data are amazing. Like, did you know that one out of every, uh, that that um, one out of four healthcare workers in New York City is unvaccinated? Kind of astounding. 58% of nursing home aides around the country are unvaccinated. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing how many people fall into this category. But in any case, isn't it easier as a selling point to just take it, make it so that the person who's vaccine hesitant or skeptical can just say, oh, well, you know, I, I, I had to, my, my job required it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. And in fact, I'm much more in favor of, uh, private, uh, companies, uh, and then local, uh, governments, especially say through school districts taking the lead on this. And I would urge any and all to please do this, make mandates at the local level. I'm a little more skeptical perhaps than Bill is that this is something that can or should be tackled, uh, at the, the most sweeping national level, given that it is so guaranteed as he saw, Bill saw in reaction to his own column to inspire a a kind of inevitable political backlash to this, that, oh, it's the tyrannical Biden administration trying to tell me what to do. Now, and I would also add one more kind of wrinkle to the conversation um, that I think one big reason why we're having so much trouble with this, in addition to everything else, Republicans deliberately sowing skepticism about this and disinformation circulating around and then innate American sort of libertarian skepticism of all authorities, all of those things play a big role. But it is also true that a lot of institutions that are supposed to be authoritative on this have made mistake after mistake. Just this week, the CDC announced that it is going to, it's going to say that vaccinated kids in school, so like, say, my daughter who's in high school and has been vaccinated, she's going to be required to wear a mask in school this fall because there might be some unvaccinated kids who come from anti-vax families there. It's not clear to me exactly what sense that makes. It doesn't appear that the spike in Delta variant cases is being driven primarily by vaccinated break breakout of uh, uh, disease among the vaccinated spreading to the unvaxxed. It's mainly people who are unvaccinated spreading it to each other. And as I indicated in the last segment, the irony here is that you're asking the people who actually did go out and do the intelligent and socially responsible thing of getting vaccinated and who probably were pretty vigilant about wearing masks all along to now put the masks back on 
because there's this other group of Americans who refuse to do the intelligent and socially uh, responsible thing. And then those people, the irresponsible ones, can simply point to things like the CDC insisting on this very rule as this is not this is not a group of people we should be paying too much attention to because they keep getting these things wrong. Just today, Thursday, the, the Washington, D.C.'s uh, local government announced that it's going to start mandating mask wearing in restaurants again and, among, and even outside, which has never made any sense to have to wear masks outdoors. So we see this over and over again where, where government authorities sort of put their foot uh, in it or they stay, you know, they slip on a banana peel or put their foot in their mouth, whatever metaphor you want to use, which then just gives fodder to the skeptics to say, aha, see, you don't know what you're talking about. I'll decide for myself what's best. So in general, I don't find much of this other than the Biden administration's ability to distribute vaccines. Once the, the administration came in within two months, they became available for pretty much anyone who wanted it. Well done. They did a great job there. Other than that, you know, the last point, why is it that the CDC isn't going to officially approve these vaccines for normal use until the end of this year, a year after? I think that would be the FDA. You mean the oh, FDA? Oh, the FDA. Yes, yes, the FDA. Yeah. Yeah. Why? I mean, I know that there are questions about, well, we don't want to accelerate the process because then it'll look like there was politics involved. But still, millions, tens of millions of people have taken this vaccine with essentially no bad side effects under emergency use, usage authorization, and yet we have to wait. Wouldn't the people trying to uh, push a kind of mandate for this in all these different institutions have a lot more authority on their side if they could say, look, it's been approved just like the vaccines that we require for school about measles and, and mumps and rubella and all the other ones. And instead, we're in this position where, you know, it's not pronounced safe until, what, 80, 80, 100, 120 million people have already had it put in their arms. So in general, I find it a, a distressing reality we're, we're faced with here. So I'm a little more indulgent toward the CDC than you are. I think there is a fog of war element here, and uh, it's really tough when the information is coming at you like a fire hose to sort of get it right all at, at every single stage of the process. Though I would agree that they they screwed up badly on the testing early on where they they wouldn't approve, you know, the tests that the WHO had available and they insisted on their own and their own didn't work and that was that was a real screw up. And I would add one more, which is you, in the course of your comments, you said something about we, we don't think that this is the result of breakthrough infections. And I think as a general rule, that's absolutely right. I mean, this is a an epidemic of the unvaccinated. But here's one problem. The CDC is not keeping good records on breakthrough infections. So we actually aren't sure how much protection we all who have been vaccinated actually have against Delta. And there have been lots of reports, I have to say, disturbing, disturbingly high number of reports of people getting breakthrough infections. They don't wind up in the hospital. They don't wind up dead, so far as we can tell. But and again, the re recording isn't that good, but um, it, like anecdotally, um, they they get very sick, you know, like 103 degree fevers. Uh, Dr. Ajish Jha, who was speaking with Bill Crystal on Conversations this week, described that. So anyway, it's um, that's that's one area where I do think um, I do think the CDC should should step up its uh, step up its game, Linda. Um, so the Republicans seem to have changed their tune suddenly, like almost as if, a, a, you know, a, a directive came down, you know, please go out there and start telling people to get vaccinated. It's almost like they realize, whoops, these are all of our viewers and our voters who are who are in danger here and who are getting sick. So um, we better change the messaging. I mean, just a few weeks ago when CPAC had their big conference, they were talking about the Fauci ouchie. Um, and uh, Ron DeSantis had flags made, don't Fauci my Florida. Um, now he has uh, changed his tune. Um, and uh, and so, you know, you even have Sean Hannity coming out and saying people should get vaccinated. Uh, 
uh, uh, Mitch McConnell is apparently going to run ads on Kentucky radio stations uh, uh, urging people to get vaccinated. So, um, so that at least um, has has um, has changed. Um, so let's but, not let, let's not give uh, Sean Hannity too much credit, uh, though, Mona, because yes, he said it one night, and the next day he tried to walk it at least part way back, saying yeah. this was an individual choice, etc. And let's not forget that uh, both Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram, I think we've talked about it on this. Uh, on this program, I know we've talked about it. Uh, I've talked about it elsewhere. Uh, they are part of the great, you know, purveyors of disinformation on the vaccine. But I, I think the question of mandating uh, vaccines is, is interesting. Uh, President Biden uh, today is, uh, in fact, going to announce the mandating for federal workers. And guess who some of the first opponents are of this? Not Republicans. <laughs> it is the unions. Oh, the unions right. are not, you know, the postal workers don't like it. The American Federation of Teachers said, well, if we're going to have mandates, that has to be part of the collective bargaining. Collective process. bargaining, right, right. 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 <laughs> and so, and there are a number of unions who are pushing back on it. Um, but I happen to be one who believes that uh, employers requiring people to have vaccines is one of the best ways to make this happen. Uh, and surely not not everyone will um, you know, go along and get it, but particularly if you give people the alternative, well, you can be tested weekly, and oh, by the way, you're going to have to pay for those tests. Um, exactly. And, that's and, that's and, the know, thing, yes. That, you yes, know, there'll exactly. be some cost to this. Um, you'll start seeing more people do it. And many uh, private employers are doing it. And there's been at least one court case upholding this. And I see no reason why uh, there won't be more court cases upholding. Uh, I do agree with you and uh, about the FDA and how slow it's been. Those of us uh, who have frequently been critics of the way in which the regulatory state sometimes botches things and holds things up and stops life-saving drugs getting to market uh, quickly enough, uh, are frustrated by the FDA on this. As I understand it, it isn't so much not having the data on the effects of the vaccines on, you know, frankly, hundreds of millions of people. Um, it has more to do with the production process. And of course, there was the case in Baltimore of the vaccines there uh, not meeting standards. And so, you know, I don't want to see them be reckless about it, but I think the sooner this can get actual approval, so it's not just uh, emergency approval, that will help a bit. But I think employers requiring people to be vaccinated, to go back to work and to work in the office is absolutely the right way to go. I'm not opposed to incentives. I'm not opposed to, I think I may have told on on, on this uh, podcast that my uh, two grandsons are 18 year old, finally decided to get their second vaccines of Pfizer when I think it was CBS um, offered them $50 to spend in the store when they did so. So I'm not opposed mm -hmm. to that. I'm not opposed to making it attractive, particularly for certain populations uh, to get the vaccines. But, you know, we can't let this just be an epidemic of the unvaccinated. Um, you know, we are all Americans and we may not live in rural areas. We may not live in red states. But the fact that some of our Americans are going to be suffering and the consequences and the costs of that uh, for all of us are enormous. That's absolutely right. And um, it's going to keep, we're not going to be able to wrestle this virus down until we get herd immunity. And the only way to get herd immunity is for everybody to either get the virus or get the vaccine. And it's, uh, you know, there's a hard could, way could and I there's just an add, easy way. But, could I just add one thing yeah. on that quickly? And that is, yeah. you know, if you look at the UK right now, they have better vaccination rates than we are. And despite the Delta variant and a new uh, um, variant that is coming in from India, uh, they are doing better. They are actually seeing caseloads drop in Great Britain. And it may, I know. Be, I, it may be because they have, uh, they may be closer to reaching herd immunity 
than we are right now. I know. I looked at those stories, Linda, and I just shook my head. I was like, I must be missing something because they talk about how they have, you know, like something like 70 or more percent of the population has been immunized, but they're saying experts are puzzling over why the the Delta variant is not a problem there. And I'm thinking, what am I missing here? I don't know, but okay. um, um, I I would just underline the point you made previously, Linda, I was going to make it and you did. and, And that is that, you know, we're not, I'm not certainly, and I don't think anybody is suggesting that we, you know, strap people down and inject them against their will, but rather presenting them with alternatives, right? You know, you can either get the vaccine or submit to twice a week testing, let's say, and and you have to pay for the tests. Uh, you can get a free vaccine or you have to pay for the tests and you can choose, right? And uh, anyway, so um, all right, let us... Um, let us move on uh, to the infrastructure bill, which uh, seems to be moving forward. The Senate voted by 67 to 32 uh, to uh, move forward with this, although it has not been written, uh, which is weird. I guess they have a they have an outline, though. Uh, they want to spend. So initially, I think Biden had proposed something like two trillion or three trillion. God only knows. I mean, the way people throw around these numbers, Damon, you referred to this a few weeks ago. My God. Well, anyway, they've come to one trillion, which would include five hundred and fifty billion for um, various infrastructure investments, including roads, bridges, uh, electric grid, universal broadband, clean drinking water, ports, airports and a national network of charging stations for electric vehicles. Uh, Okay, Um, the infrastructure deal, pro or con? I'm going to pull a little uh, Don McLaughlin here. Damon. (laughs) Oh, very pro. Um, I'm I'm at three cheers for the infrastructure, a mini breakthrough that we've had here. Now, we are a long way to passage, so we shall see. But like uh, you know, a dysfunctional marriage where the, the two people right before go into the divorce attorney, they go into couples therapy and then the, the therapist says, all right, you two stop talking about the problems in your marriage. Go do this task together. You know, mm-hmm. go, go build the outhouse or whatever it is. And somehow in the process of doing that thing together, you kind of learn how to get along again and then can build a foundation. That's sort of how I see this. They actually managed to vote to move forward (laughs) with this thing, which shows like little victories. But it is a huge victory given the deadlock in Washington, given a 50-50 or 51-50, depending on how you look at it, Senate, and a very nearly evenly divided House that a Democratic president was able to propose an infrastructure bill and then moderate senators from both parties were able to get together and hash out the rudiments of a deal that enough of them were willing to give thumbs up to is is a very good sign that governing might be sort of possible on some things. <laughs> and again, little victories perhaps, but this for in the in the context of little victories, this was a pretty big one. So I'm I'm cheered by it. As to the details, I'll let other people hash out whether there's a little too much of this or a little too too uh, too too little or too much of this or that thing. I think in general it's a good mix of kind of old style, hard infrastructure projects, roads, trains, uh, transportation things, combined with attempting to kind of prime the pump for transformation away from fossil fuels in things like uh, renewable energy and charging stations and some of the other items that you mentioned, Mona. So it looks like a a good direction and uh, I'm cheered by it. Yeah. Uh, I just wish that the, all that electrical energy that is going to power these electric cars around the country were coming more from nuclear, but that's another matter. Um, Bill Galston, uh, this says good things, doesn't it, about the Biden administration's assessment of its own interests, right? I mean, they, they, they negotiated and they came, they came to an agreement. They made that decision that this was good for them, right? Look, this was, this was a very broad-based negotiation. Uh, It involved not only the White House, uh, but also Mitch McConnell's office. 
And I noted with interest that it was not until the Republican negotiators emerged from Mitch McConnell's office after a long meeting uh, that they were able to announce an agreement. Uh, I also note with interest that Mitch McConnell was one of the 17 Republican senators who actually voted to advance the bill. Uh, and I, I agree with Damon's assessment of, uh, of the contents of the bill, which I think are almost entirely appropriate and forward-looking. Uh, but this is part of an extraordinarily complex legislative dance that's only in its opening phases. Uh, there are all sorts of two-way political linkages between this tr pretty traditional infrastructure bill and the much larger $3.5 trillion package of what has come to be called human infrastructure as opposed to physical infrastructure. Uh, it's a process that will begin with a budget bill. Uh, that's, the, that's what triggers the reconciliation process, a budget bill that specifies a top line number, in this case, $3.5 trillion, along with instructions to the committees of jurisdiction. And whether that second bill is going to go through smoothly is anyone's guess. Uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, who was one of the lead Democratic negotiators on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, has indicated publicly uh, that she's not comfortable with the $3.5 trillion figure and got enormous blowback from AOC and some other members of the Progressive Caucus who threatened to withhold their votes from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, so there are very complex linkages here. Uh, I think Cinema is really quite serious about what she said. Otherwise, she wouldn't have said it because it certainly is not immediately helpful either to her or the Democratic Party, but she wanted to put down a marker. So whether this is the first step of a dance that's going to lead to legislative success uh, is anybody's guess. I am reasonably confident, however, that either two bills will pass in the end or no bills will pass in the end. And whether it's possible for two bills to pass is, I think, still very uncertain. Yeah, Linda, I, I I'm um, my eyes cross when I read all of this because you know there's the there's the reconciliation path that they may want to take with this budget bill that will that will you know in theory go through on. Uh, on party line vote, but if Kirsten Cinema is against it, then it won't. Um, and and also Nancy Pelosi is saying that that she'll only bring up the traditional infrastructure bill that we've been talking about if the other one is also approved. So the whole thing is really murky, isn't it? Well, I think it is, but I think the progressives who are opposing the bipartisan bill. Uh, on the basis that we did not get the whole pie, we only got an, uh, a slice of the pie, and until we get the whole pie, we're not uh, playing. Uh, I think that's very destructive, and I think it's a kind of cut off your nose to spite your face. Uh, we do need infrastructure. I mean, anybody who has been out of the house and has driven on roads any place in the United States realizes that our infrastructure is um, failing. It's, I mean, we've got lousy roads, we've got bridges, um, that are dangerous. Uh, we've got um, an electric grid uh, that is uh, not really able to handle the, um, the extreme weather that we're seeing, both hot and cold. Uh, so we need it. We need an infrastructure yeah. bill. Oh, and we need to get the lead out of pipes. And we need to get the lead out of pipes. I mean, you know, this has a permanent effect on children's brains. So, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of stuff in that bill that we need. And I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic than Bill is uh, about whether or not we will see um, an infrastructure bill passed, and and that it will may not necessarily be the you know three tr trillion dollars or whatever the number is uh, today uh, that the de progressives want, uh, or the one trillion dollars uh, that the uh, bipartisan folks have come together on. Um, you know, we're talking about a whole lot of money here. 
And one of the dangers in our economy right now is the possibility of inflation. And anyone who lived through, and Bill certainly did, as did I, uh, the uh, years of the 1970s know that you know, there is no more regressive tax on the poor than inflation. And if we start uh, pouring too much money and superheat the economy uh, and uh, we end up with inflation as a result of it, that's not going to help anybody. Okay, we will follow the travails of the infrastructure bill as as it wends its way through the Congress. Um, for now, let us turn to our highlights and lowlights of the week. Damon Linker, you first. Well, uh, this week uh, I'm going to highlight a good book about a bad subject. This is um, a, a brand new book. I think it's actually just out right around now. I've had a copy uh, a couple of weeks ahead of schedule. Um, it's from Yale University Press. The author is Matthew Rose, and the title is A World After Liberalism, Philosophers of the Radical Right. Uh, it's a very lucid, uh, clearly written book, um, basically just sketches uh, several figures who are most of them not household names, but all of whom uh, have turned out, uh, surprise to everyone, <laughs> it appears, to uh, have echoes in our current moment. So anyone trying to understand just what the hell is going on with uh, not just the Republican Party in the United States, but in uh, with the rise of right-wing populism around the world, I'd recommend this book. Uh, it's very easy to read and very interesting. The sketches, several figures, some of whom are Oswald Spengler. He's probably the best-known figure in here. And then Julius Evola, Francis Parker Yockey, Sam Francis, and a couple of others. Um, so, uh, again, it, you, know, you might not want to read it right before bed uh, in order to avoid the, the, the nightmares, but uh, it, I definitely definitely recommend it. It's a stimulating and chilling read. Mm. Um, as was your column uh, about the uh, the conversation between uh, the the uh, Claremont guy, Michael Anton, and who was he talking with? Who was Curtis who was Yarvin? Curtis Yarvin, yeah. who is a uh, monarchist who favors uh, that uh, that a president become a dictator and take over the country and rule as a as an American Caesar. Yeah, uh, really right. remarkable. And of course, he was invited onto this podcast by Michael Anton, who uh, used to work for Donald Trump on the National Security Council. So if there is a, God forbid, a second Trump administration, this is a guy who could end up with a senior job there. So, um, yeah. yeah, speaking yeah. of chilling. Speaking of, yeah, speaking of nightmares. All right, yeah. Linda. Well, I'm going to, we never seem to be able to leave Trump out of any of our discussions, and I'm going to bring him back in right now. Um, my low light of the week is, um, there are several articles on it, but one that I would point readers to is one in Political Magazine, uh, Politico, uh, rather, and it points to the recent endorsement for the position of Texas Attorney General that President, former President Trump made of Ken Paxton. Uh, Ken Paxton, as uh, some of our listeners know, because we've talked about it before on the program, is under indictment for securities fraud. He's also being investigated by the FBI for corruption. He had several of his staff uh, quit uh, and blow the whistle on him. Uh, and it wasn't as if Trump didn't have another endorsement he might have made. Uh, and that person uh, was George P. Bush, uh, the youngest Bush name uh, in that family uh, to come on the political scene. And, and the saddest thing about this whole endorsement is it is not terribly surprising that, that Trump uh, endorsed Paxton. The saddest thing was the spectacle of George P. Bush, whose mother uh, is a Mexican born, his father, Jeb Bush, um, was obviously governor of Florida. And despite Trump's attacks on the Trump family, on the uh, Bush family over and over again over the years, uh, George P. went down to Mar-a-Lago and kissed the ring and tried to do everything in his power. And basically, Donald Trump gave him the middle finger. Yeah. Uh, but for Wales. Uh, <laughs> all right. Bill Galston. Yeah, uh, 
My nominee for uh, greater attention this week is a wonderful article in the New York Times, and I don't often put those words together anymore, uh, by a reporter by the name of Katie Gluck, who very, uh, very carefully charted the surge of Eric Adams, uh, New York City's mayor presumptive, to the very center of Democratic Party discussion about how to handle uh, police reform and, you know, and policing at the same time. Uh, Eric Adams has achieved a unique credibility as someone in favor of both uh, stringent policing and police reform uh, because of his extensive background as as a policeman and and an officer himself in the New York City Police Department. So uh, for a party that desperately needs uh, some some way of of dulling the uh, Republican charges of weakness on crime, Adams is being hailed as a savior. And uh, if the party listens to him, he could very well turn out to be the answer. Hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to highlight uh, a podcast hosted by Barry Weiss, formerly of the New York Times. Uh, It's called Honestly. Um, And uh, the episode that I'd like to laud is uh, one featuring... um, No, I just sounded, I just realized the two words sound alike. But anyway, I'm lauding Maude Marin. <laughs> um, Maude Marin is a progressive, a Bernie Sanders voter. She was a public defender who worked for legal aid for many years, and she has been dragged and canceled uh, because she dared to object to the anti racist training <laughs> that was being required in the public schools in New York including um, uh, defining qualities such as worship of the written word, individualism, and objectivity as examples of white supremacy culture. Um, She has really um, had a very tough time of it since coming out against those things. Uh, She's been called a racist, a white supremacist herself, and uh, it's a very, um, a very moving and uh, an informative episode of Honestly. So I recommend it. All right. Uh, thanks, one and all. We um, ran a little long this week because we had a lot to get through. But uh, we want to thank Elliot Abrams again for joining us. Uh, thank you all for listening. And we will return next week as every week. <laughs> <laughs>